Okay, welcome everybody. Hope you can all hear me. This is the first time I'm doing this meeting on Microsoft Teams and uh, um, yeah. Can everybody hear me? Everybody good? If you can't hear me, just raise your hand. No, okay. All right, so uh, let me start off by introducing myself. Uh, so uh, my name is Troy Lars. Uh, I'm, some of you know me as Captain Lars, or whatever you want to call it, but I'm, I'm Troy Lars. I just want to formally introduce myself um, and then just run through the, the process, what we're going to be doing here today, okay? Um, and then I'm going to be handing over to Harold, and Harold will introduce his team. So I think it's important from a disclaimer perspective that everybody understands what my role is and understands where I fit into the picture, because I think some people might be a little bit confused when you Google me and you find me as a financial advisor, then you find me as a captain, and then you find me investigating Ponzi schemes. So uh, some of you have had this conversation with you already, so you'll already know what I'm gonna tell you, Eklund. So I'm Batman. Okay, and I know it sounds really weird to try and explain it to you. It's just, it's the easiest way to try and explain this thing to you. So from the perspective that um, my Bruce Wayne part of my job, I have my own practice. I'm an investment specialist. I haven't got a single client in this thing. I haven't got a single friend, a single family member or anything like that. Um, I'm gonna to get to how I got involved with this particular matter. But um, I have my own practice, my own brokerage called Shepherd Advisory Trading as Momentum Consult Featherbrook. So that's the Bruce Wayne part of the job that I do. The captain part of the job, the Batman part of the job is that I am the provincial head for the reservist of Gauteng, okay? My background is that I've worked in child protection units, I've worked detective services, I've worked at various units of the police, organized crime. Um, and um, my capacity is, my because of my capacity as a captain, sorry guys, uh, Rob Brad, if you can maybe just mute your video You're and everybody else just mic. mute your video. Sorry, captain. Yeah. The mic's muted. Okay, no, sorry. Okay, there we go, thanks very much. Okay guys, sorry, can you hear me now? Okay, if you do have a video link, please, if you're on the, on the Microsoft Teams, please cut your video link because it's gonna draw out and we're not gonna be able to, be able to follow. So just for the guys that are attending in terms of Microsoft Teams. So coming back to this thing, sorry. So I'm, I'm a captain, I'm, pro, I'm stationed at the provincial office. I am the Gauteng coordinator. So I run all the police stations, all the specialized units in terms of the reservists. So that gives me the, the ability to basically uh, work together with the SAPS and together with, with FIXA. So I've worked on a previous investigation with FIXA, Harrod will, 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 uh, can vouch for that. Um, and I, uh, my previous partner, if you wanna call it that, he committed a Ponzi scheme or committed, uh, there's a case that's been investigated against him and I, I went through that whole process. So in terms of the WhatsApp group that we started, everything else, we've already done this before. So I've got that experience. So that's where I fit into the picture. I just wanna also tell you that in terms of there are two sets, there's two cases, two main cases that are being investigated. There's a case in Cape Town under the Table View case, and there's a case, there's a couple of cases in Johannesburg. The Johannesburg cases are all combined and are investigated by the Johannesburg Commercial Crimes. The Cape Town cases are also combined and investigated by the commercial uh, crimes in Cape Town. We've got it as two separate investigations for the reason being it's strategic that we can make sure that we um, are not, there's, there's no form of corruption. It just gives us a second bite of the apple and it just means that we're gonna be a lot more thorough. So that's why we're not, we're not combining the cases at this stage, okay? Once the investigations are complete, we may combine them, but as it stands right now, there are two sets of investigations going on. I am, I am part of the team that is liaising with, or doing the work with the Janisburg Commercial Crimes. The investigating officer is Captain Mashala, Okay, and the head of the unit is Colonel Bainkis. So I work with Colonel Bainkis and Captain Mashala at Janusburg Commercial, Commercial Crimes in the investigation of this. this the, the case that was opened, the Douglas Dale case, the complainant in the matter is me, as in Captain Lars, as in the state. So if I can explain to you why we did that. We did that because the problem is if I take one person's statement and I make that the main complainant, then it's only a case of a million rand versus possibly two billion rand or whatever the value is. Okay, so myself as the state, I'm the complainant in this particular matter. So there's a lot of measures that we've put in place to make sure that the case is protected, okay, and that the case gets seen right through to the end. The case was, the Janusburg case was registered on the 28th of August. It's already sending out the prosecutor from about the 23rd of September, okay, which means within a month, 
the case was already gone to prosecution. Okay. Uh, the, Cape, the Cape Town case, the Tableview case, was registered in the first week of uh, September, so about a week and a half later. I'm not sure where they are with that particular matter. Okay, I can give feedback at a later stage once we've spoken to the Cape Town people. So, um, let me also just start by saying that in terms of the investigation, the first case that we started, the docket was registered at 700 million rand. Okay, it was a Presidium case. The Presidium case at that stage when we started to investigate was then linked to Imaginer. Okay, so just from a SAP's perspective, I'm not sure to talk about a fixer, that's fixer's role. Okay, the two cases are going to be seen as one. So I just want to clarify that. It's not a case against Imagine and a case against Presidium. It's a case of the, 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 the powers that are involved in a particular matter we're investigating as one. The other thing that you also need to understand is that there's different law firms that are involved. There's Tim Wheeler, there's Sandra Copeland, there's Alex Elliott, there's a, there's a whole bunch of lawyers representing different parties, okay? I'm not sure to comment on any civil matters. I'm not a civil lawyer, okay? My role is from the SAPS's perspective, okay? And to try and address and give you a little bit more clarity um, and answers on the police's side. The regulator, which is represented by Harold and his team, he'll introduce them now. They are looking at it from the regulation perspective. So I invest, and, and, and again, I'm not going to steal Harold's fire, he'll cover all of that part. So I'm here to talk to you today about the SAPS investigation. So a couple of common questions that people are asking me, okay? First question I'm getting is, why haven't we locked anybody up, okay? So I think, you know, and there's a gentleman sitting at the back there, a very seasoned investigator, his name is Chad, okay? So he's done lots of these things. So I'm sure Chad will be able to tell you in terms of the, the time period it takes for an investigation to take place. I wish to remind you, from the 28th of August to about the 23rd of September, the case was, went through, was done quite quickly. We gathered a lot of evidence and it was submitted to the prosecutor for prosecution, okay? Um, there's other stuff that's been gathered. So the, in, in South Africa, just to give you in context, the average amount of dockets a detective will sit with is about 80. Janice commercial crime sits with between 80 to 100 cases. So the route that we've done by having this WhatsApp group and by communicating with you and by doing everything that we're doing, I honestly feel is efficient. In terms of the arrest, there's a process that must be adhered to, okay? The prosecutor is the person that will issue the warrant of arrest. Because you must understand, if someone commits murder in front of me, can I, I can arrest him straight away. When a crime happens over a period and that person, the, the, the court must decide, issue the warrant. So we are waiting for the NPA, the National Prosecuting Authority, to, for people that we've identified as um, people of interest to pull those people in and to, if need be, detain those people. And we are aware of, of uh, flight risks. Another thing I just want to cover in terms of this, what we're covering with you, there is certain information that I'm not going to be able to tell you. For the simple reason, I've got 200 people sitting on Microsoft Teams listening and I've got 40, 40 50 people here. I know for a fact, I can guarantee you, okay, that one of these 20, 200 people sitting on here is part of the party that we're investigating, okay, because I cannot vet every single person that comes to this particular matter, okay. For that reason, we can only give you information, okay, that is not going to be harmful to the case, okay, and that we can substantiate, if that makes any sense, okay. Um, just also in terms of disclaimer, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page, no media here. Okay, all right. The reason I ask that is because this is an investors meeting to give you feedback, okay? We've made it very clear in terms of the agenda and in terms of the disclaimers that we sent out. We're trying to make this, and this is the first time I think we've done something like this, eh, Harold? Okay, so I think in terms of where we are with this investigation and in terms of the progress and in terms of all that stuff and the communication, I certainly believe that we're on track. So as to the detention of the, of the, of the perpetrators, uh, the people of, of interest that we identify that we can link to the case of fraud, we will be detaining, okay? You need to understand the definition of fraud. The first thing I need to clarify, because a lot of people are asking me, and I'm going to use an example, Andrew Cunningham or Brett Bierkus on the Presidium side, okay? Why haven't I detained that particular member, okay? So the way it works is that from an investigation perspective is that I have to go to the prosecutor and I have to prove that that person intentionally, knowingly, Okay, misrepresented and benefited financially from, from, from that particular crime. So if, 
I don't know how else to say this, but stupidity is not a crime. Okay, ignorance is not a crime. Poor governance is not a crime. So on the civil side, in terms of delinquent directors, in terms of what the directors, in terms of their due diligence are not doing their job properly, that is for the attorneys to sort out on civil matters. Okay, my role is to determine, the, uh, and, the, and the Commercial Crimes Unit and the SAPS, is to determine if a crime has taken place, and then the parties to those crimes, that they are participants, willing participants, and they are intentional participants. So in terms of certain parties, we have identified uh, people, okay, um, and we now need to look at, at, at expediting the, the prosecution of those people and the, and the warrants. That tomorrow morning, the NPA will be sitting down. There is a, there's a team meeting happening tomorrow to sit with the prosecutor to expedite the matter and to give the prosecutor an overall view of where we are. And from there, we're hoping that that will then, de uh, that will then uh, lead us to arrests being made. Flight risks. Let me cover that. So in terms of flight risks, yes, there are people of flight risks and we are monitoring the activity of certain individuals of interest. Please also understand that until a person is charged, I cannot go and say to you that this person is, is, is guilty. It's the same in terms of the press. So we are not able to go and say to you as much as what I'd like to, you can all use your own brains and your own interpret your own things, but okay. But I cannot, in a public platform, go and say that person there is a person that is of interest and I'm detaining that particular person, okay? Because that's how the law works. You as a, as a, as a citizen of the country are protected by the Constitution, as is everybody else. Okay, so that's, that's where we are. The investigation, I'm very confident that the case of misrepresentation and fraud is definitely there. I have no doubt about that. And again, Fixer will, will give you their, their viewpoint, okay? Um, we just need to now prosecute and get the people detained, okay? Flight risks. I just want to go back to flight risks. The people that we are persons of interest, okay, we are monitoring them, okay? We are, we are monitoring to see that they leave the country, or if they do leave the country, then obviously we will intercede, okay? But at this stage, I've got to wait until tomorrow. As soon as a warrant is issued, then I can take away people's passports. I cannot take people's passports away unless I charge them and I do a warning statement and things like that. Again, you as, a, you as an individual are protected by the Constitution. Every individual in South Africa is protected by that same Constitution. Then in terms of uh, where the money is from a SAPS perspective, again, that's, we are aware where some funds are on certain platforms. I'm not at liberty to disclose to, disclose to you the amounts or anything like that at this particular stage because it's of the sensitivity of the, of, of the information. Okay. I can say from, from, from my perspective, okay, that in terms of the amount of capital, okay, it's, it's not a large amount, okay, it really isn't. So at this stage, from what I've seen so far, okay, and I don't know the regulator, that they also, they also can't really tell you much, they'll, they'll cover that perspective, but I do want to try and manage the expectation, and the majority of the capital has not been found. So let's, let's just put that out there right now. Um, then just in terms of the various platforms and the modus operandi, the one thing I also just want to point out that from our, from our investigations, no technical data has been provided to us as to how this uh, trading worked, okay? In other words, until today, I've not seen any trade statements or anything that can confirm that a dollar was bought at this price and sold at this price. I've got no, no information has been provided to us, even though it's been requested, even though we're asking, okay? We haven't seen, and Fixer will have this, uh, they'll give you their feedback, okay? But at this stage, the one thing I also just want to point out that a lot of the, where people believe the money is, is based upon the information that was provided, which is the people that we're investigating. So just in terms of that information that's been provided to you, uh, I, would, I, would, I would just be hesitant in terms of uh, believing that wholeheartedly. Okay, at this stage, and if things change, great. But as it stands right now, there's no technical data, okay? There's no reserve bank clearance. So I need you to think about this. Your money, two million, five million, 50 million, whatever million it was, I mean, the, the amount is absolutely stunning when you, when you start to look at this thing. We've got clients for 50 million, okay? And yet, I haven't got a single tax certificate. I haven't got a single reserve bank clearance, okay? Now, if you, if you look at the rules in terms of the regulations and the laws, when you take out a million rand, you can take up to a million rand in travel allowance, anything up to 10 million rand, you need reserve bank clearance, anything past that, you need more. And I can bet you, yeah, not one of you are sitting here with a tax certificate, not one of you are sitting with reserve bank clearance. Anybody sitting with that? 
If you've got tax certificates, okay, then you need to chat. You're the only person out of, out of I don't know how many people we've interviewed. We'll, we'll have a look at your stuff, okay? Um, so we, we haven't seen any of that. We've got no, and again, we've got no data to, to sustain to say that this was a platform that was trading in foreign currencies and stuff, okay? So the charge of fraud is when something gets misrepresented to you for financial gain. So based upon the evidence that we have, and again, FIX will cover in terms of what they found in that, okay? We do believe that there's grounds for, for misrepresentation and that the prosecutor must look at the evidence that's been presented and that will be discussed tomorrow. Okay, um, I'm trying to think of the other stuff I need to just cover with you. Um, okay, um, I know we've got questions here. My wife is busy monitoring the messengers things. We did write down all the questions that were put to us and Carrot's gonna go through all of those questions that were submitted. Any of the questions that we got today are not gonna be because we had to prepare for today. So we didn't answer any of the questions that we got today, okay? The other thing also, just in terms of going forward, um, we will continue with the WhatsApp group and we will update and we do post regular notices and I do think that does benefit everybody, okay? Um, just also in terms of um, liquidate, liquidation. So um, FIXA will cover in terms of the liquid, you're gonna, you're gonna cover that, okay? So the, the liquidation process and all that stuff and the strategy manager, and for those who don't know, there was, a, a, there was an application made today for Imagina to be liquidated. Um, that we'll, we'll cover that just now, okay? Guys, um, before I hand over to Carrot, I'm going to give you on the floor, yeah? Is there any questions that anybody wishes to raise? I'll give you five questions and then I'm going to hand over to Carrot and we'll do a question session at the end. Um, you referred to a WhatsApp group. I know nothing about it. How do I get um, access to the WhatsApp group? So give your details there to my wife there and I'll add you to the WhatsApp group. Okay. Um, from the imagine side. From the imagine yes. Is the legal team or the attorneys, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that is um, defending whatever? Okay. So. So, okay, so just for the guys that are on Microsoft Teams, I can repeat the question. Jenpin wants to know who's the legal team representing the Imaginer clients, okay? So we've got a couple of attorneys that are representing different parties, okay? So what I will do is, I will, I, I'm not, I can't take the side of any law firm or, or go and market any particular law firm where it is, there's a couple. So what I will do is, I will put out on, on the group who the law firms are on that and you decide who you want to contact and get into contact with because it's not fair. I've got Tim Wheeler with, a, with Presidium as an example and I've got Sandra who's also Presidium and it's unfair for me to give one particular law firm but there are a couple. So what I will do is on the, on the, um, on the WhatsApp group, I will provide the law firms that are involved in which matters and then you can contact them. Is that fair? Imagine the people. But that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Asking yeah. Well, are you asking who's, who's defending the accused? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I thought you meant in terms of the, the, the investors on the Imaginer side. The Imaginer people. Okay. So the Imaginer people, okay, the, the, in terms of, the, uh, so Craig Massain, each yes. person has his own lawyer. So Craig Massain has, uh, <laughs> has a guy called Sean, okay, um, Sean Pinal, okay. If you're talking about the directors on Presidium, the, the, uh, Andrew has uh, oh, Veron Veronica, uh, Veronica Villillis, okay, okay, uh, from Norton's, and then Brett Beakers has Warren, so they've each got their own attorney. There isn't an attorney that's representing all the parties, which is also a bit concerning because now that the chickens have come home to roost, everybody's running in a different direction. So there isn't a party that is representing everybody involved, okay. Uh, Carl Jafters has his own attorney. Craig has his own attorney. Brett has his own attorney. Andrew has his own attorney. So all of those people have their own attorneys. Okay, so. And has every investor been informed of these forums? I came across it coincidentally yesterday or the day before yesterday. Um, I was not approached by anybody. So, so. Coincidental that I figured this out. Okay, so the gentleman wished I can repeat the question back. Gentleman wants to know about the, 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 how information about these forums is being distributed, basically. Okay, so you must understand that if I can talk about for Fixer, Fixer, the policy of Fixer is that they cannot go onto a social media platform, neither can SAPS go onto a social media platform. It's not something that we can generally put out there in terms of the rules and regulations. So what we have done is, 
we have started a WhatsApp group. There's 250 people there, okay? And what we've done is every time there's a WhatsApp group, we try and link it to that one WhatsApp group. The problem that we are gonna have is it's gonna reach capacity now 250, so we might have to start another group. So all the information that we are getting that we can share, we share via that WhatsApp group via myself, okay? And your own voices, okay? So there's two admins and then Theo. There's three admins on the particular group and we distribute this only for admins. The reason I only do that is because I don't have the time to run through 10 million emotional, and I'm sorry to say this, but emotional stuff that's gonna come on there and everybody's opinion. Okay, the other problem also is the admins of the WhatsApp group must understand is a thing called vicarious liability. If people are starting to share the details of the suspect and his children and all those type of things and those people get hurt, Myself as an admin, and this admin here can be held liable under vicarious liability for the harm that comes to any particular parties. And again, I don't want to, I don't want to participate in that, particular, in that particular way. Okay? So, yeah, so the forums is difficult for us because I don't know who's invested in this thing. Okay? What will happen is eventually through the, through, the, uh, through the auditing and the liquidation and that, they will get the records of the investors and they will send, a, an inf they will send information to the investors if that helps out. Okay. Sorry, but if you take control of the PW platform, then all the details are there. Have you taken control of that? Because all the investors' details should be there. Okay, so that again will be what Fixer will cover. I'm sapped, so they'll come back to your question there. But yes, in terms of the, the, the uh, there's a process that they have to abide by, and they'll cover that with you now. Okay, questions? If the funds have left the country, I mean, you say you've found a small amount of funds. Yeah. So funds should have left the country. Surely there must be bank trails, paper trails, yeah. and all that. Okay, so just to repeat the question for those on Microsoft Teams. Okay, the question is, if the money has left the country, it must be traceable through bank accounts. Okay, so that's 100% correct. Okay, so there's bank records and everything are being, are being pulled, okay, and there's a whole forensic stuff that must happen. I just need to explain to you, you need to understand, there's 1,300 investors. This thing is potentially 2.5 billion rand. That's the potential of what it has, okay. Um, I mean, uh, Presidium uh, is about 1.2 billion. Imagine uh, I estimate to be another maybe about a billion. This is my estimate. It's not factual figures, okay? And then there's other entities that may be involved, okay? So to trace all of those financial histories of 1,300 is going to take a bit of time, okay? Again, that's the part that they will, they will cover with you now. But yes, we have started to look at that. But in the interim, and again, folks will cover what they've done, and they're going to show you where, where they've gone and where they've looked for the money, okay? But that's what I'm saying to you. In terms of what you've been told, okay, and where it is, I, I, until the way that I would work it, until I see something physical, that there's a, there's a statement from Prime X, FX Secure, whatever it is, and you can phone that person and say, that's my money on that platform. Great. But that's not what we're finding. Okay. Any other, one more last question before I hand over to Carrot. Right. Yeah. Uh, what about the investors from Mauritius who invested via appointed agents for the region in Okay, so the question is, what about the guys that invested offshore through Mauritius, through Seychelles, through Singapore, whatever it is, okay? So just in terms of, of that part, I just want to cover a couple of issues. So the first part is that in terms of jurisdiction, so the guys that invested money in the US or Seychelles, Mauritius, okay, depending if that money came from that particular jurisdiction, that ju regulator and on that side will inve can investigate and get involved in that particular matter. In terms of a US charge, because there's also talk about a US charge for investors in the US, okay? I'm not a, I'm, I don't speak on behalf of the federal government of the US and in terms of their crimes, so I can't comment in terms of that, okay? But in terms of the actual, it still gets seen as one case. Even though, the, because the crime took place here in South Africa, the people who did the trading, the people who did, who were part of the supposed, whatever you want to call it, okay? At this stage, let's call it possibly Ponzi scheme, okay? Um, they, it happened here in South Africa, even though they're in Mauritius. So in terms of those clients, it will still be investigated, John, still be investigated in terms of the regulator. The added advantage that people outside in the Seychelles, in Zambia, in Singapore, whatever it is, is that they themselves can further also um, lay extra charges or they've got an extra avenue to pursue in terms of the regulator in that jurisdiction. Okay, next question. Okay. So the brokers that were responsible, the people who sold this thing, okay? Again, 
Fixer will cover that portion from a regulation perspective, okay? But from a SAPS perspective, if any individual, and I'm just going to say names, okay? I'm just going to mean, because let's say Alan, uh, Darren, I don't know, whoever, Matt, freaking Paul, Sue, John, whoever, came and sold you that particular product, okay? Again, if we can prove, if we find that they were aware that this wasn't what it was, and they carried on and they benefited financially, we will charge them with fraud. If, however, we cannot prove that they knew that, they were, that it was the intent and they knew it was, then I can't charge them in terms of fraud. The regulator will cover in terms of the other avenues. I'm here in terms of the fraud case, the misrepresentation. And the big part of misrepresentation is intent. Okay. Gerard, my, my colleague here on my left, is an ex-prosecutor, so he knows already in terms of that. The, the, the key is about intent. Okay. Paula, next question. Okay. So Sure. Uh, you said that you guys have not received any of the technical data from FIXA and SAPS. I'm, I'm yet to speak for facts. They will cover this stuff. Yeah. I, have, I haven't seen anything. Nothing. Has, so, is there any... Uh, uh, Can I just ask, the reason being that you've only found a small portion of the money, is that because the people accused aren't, aren't helping? No. So, so the, 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 the people accused are not helping. So in terms of the people who are helping with the investigation, Andrew Cunningham helps with the investigation. This is on the Presidium side. Okay, because remember, that's where my investigation started. So in terms of cooperation, we've got cooperation from Andrew Cunningham. He's provided us with a statement. He's provided us with detail. We can phone him now and he'll answer. He'll take the call. Again, on the Presidium side. Brett Bierkes, nothing. I've been told, I'm gonna, we, we have been told by his attorney he will offer us full uh, cooperation. I've asked for a statement. They're not willing to give me a statement. Hopefully we'll interview him. But I've heard nothing from Brett Bierkes. Craig Massain, nothing. Nothing. That's on the Presidium side. Okay. The Imaginer side has only come to light recently. So that's just, that, that, that we're going that particular route. And we are, we are chatting. The staff who worked at Presidium have offered cooperation. So we're interviewing the staff. Okay, so those are the people that are participating in that. Coming back to your question about the technical data, okay, I've, I've spoken to many people and I've asked anybody, so anybody, I'm not talking about the product brochure. So there's a product brochure that you got, tells you about the company, it's got all graft on, that's not technical data. Technical data is in terms of the fact, as an example, they spoke about a stop loss, so, okay, again, we don't see how that worked. That stop loss, according to the statements, that, that thing was stopped months ago, if, if it even existed in the first place. The Black Swan event, I've spoken to CFAs, investment analysts, I've spoken to various people. Nobody can give me any time period where a Black Swan event for, uh, happened. Okay? The only time the currencies dropped by such a big percentage was the Swiss franc to the euro, and that was when the Swiss franc linked to the euro. And I'm not talking about the Zimbabwean dollar here, okay? I'm talking about currencies, okay? Because no one in their right mind is going to take your money and buy the Zimbabwean dollar. Let's be honest, okay? So the platform works on derivatives in terms of currencies, okay? We haven't got any technical data, and I've asked everybody, anybody to provide me with any information where they can tell me that they got this report and this was the data that ran, okay? We have also, just so you know, together with Fixer, been to Craig Massain's offices, okay, and we and and, and we, we we we're aware of of where they where everybody is. Let's just put it to that way, okay. Um, but y'all, okay. Any other question? You've been talking about Rick and Craig. And yes. Um, Craig's father, Johan, is is a director. Yes. Okay. Is he has he been approached? Is he have so. Okay, so nobody from Imaginer has also been assisted with on the investigation side, okay? Just remember, I just want to go back a step. The Imaginer only came to light in the last week or two, okay? So right now where we are is I need direction from the NPA, okay? In terms of the certain stuff that we've requested, which will then link to the Imaginer. So we have started investigating the Imaginer, and the Imaginer is being more investigated by the Cape Town case. Okay, because remember there's two cases. So they started the other way. They've started with the Imaginer, we started with the Presidium, okay? And the two are coming together, it's one entity, okay? Um, on the historical data, um, do you remember I gave some sheets through with regards yes. to their supposed performance through, I think it was March, April, yes. May? Um, would that be then used as part of their misrepresentation because that's giving you figures as to their performance over 
the last five years. Okay, so Wayne, so Wayne at the back is asking for the guys on Microsoft that he's got certain data that he got, <coughs> which is not actually accurate. Okay, which actually proves again to the charge of misrepresentation. So yes, exactly that. That data, again, is misrepresentation. Okay, so that data, so you must remember the data that is provided, and that's one of the reasons why I believe we haven't got the data, because it'll add, because you have to provide data, and providing data, you are saying that those are the trades that actually happened. And if we can prove that that's actually not what happened, that'll just add again to the misrepresentation. Okay. Sir. Do you have the rights to go into their office and just take all their filing cabinets and everything? So the, again, that's where the prosecutor comes in. In terms of search warrants and arrest warrants and that type of thing, okay, you must also remember that there's certain evidence that we've already got, okay, which I don't need to go to the office to. Okay? You must remember that you've all got portals that, you, that you're accessing. So there's all sorts of data that we've already obtained. In terms of yes, if the prosecutor feels that there's a valid reason, as does fixers feel that they've got a valid reason, we, the court will then appoint us a search warrant. If we tick those boxes, yes, then we can. But I can't just rock up and go into someone's house. Not so easy. You must remember financial records, is a, financial crimes is very different because financial crimes, you have to leave a trace. And I know people are going to ask me, what about Bitcoin? You must realize that when you buy Bitcoin, you have to have left an entry spot. So it has to have left from your F&B account. You get what I'm saying? So it does leave a paper trail. Okay, plus you must remember that everything is electronic and everything else. You can go and you can shred, you can do all sorts of stuff. IP addresses and all sorts of stuff. We live in a day of age of technology. <laughs> okay. So true, in terms of technical data, so you haven't been able to get anything from the supposed Epic Primus platform no, so we, we so on again, Fixer will confirm this. So from our side, we have we have looked at some of the platforms, and some of the information is very contradictory. Let's put it to that way that we've received, which makes us a little bit suspicious. But uh, we haven't got any no platform. I haven't got platforms where I can say, listen, guys, all of your money is sitting at Primus. There was a there was two billion rand, and I can account for two billion rand. There's bits and pieces here and there. Okay, which I can't go into detail with, but it's nowhere near what you think it is. And that's why my, in terms of managing the expectation, I, I have to, I, I can't sit here and bullshit you, okay. The majority of the capital we have not traced. And the majority of the, and I mean, it's not, this thing's been going on from us is about a month, from folks is a couple of months. And by now, if it was really a legitimate thing, why is information not there? No clients, to my knowledge, have been drawing money since I think it was March. And the other thing I just want to also say that the, the information about stuff being frozen and this and that and all sorts of stuff, a lot of, we've had a lot of misinformation that's been out there. And that's why it's a little bit difficult on our side to do stuff because we don't want to add to that misinformation. Okay. But did you state that on the PW platform, you know, that the, uh, by Andrew, I think, uh, saying that that money is lying in the next Okay, so for those that are Microsoft team, the gentleman is saying that on the portal, Andrew is saying on the on the PW P, PDM platform, whatever reserve it is. PDM yes, or it's supposed to be on a reserve by Fixer and Frozen and all sorts of stuff. Again, Fixer will cover that. I'm not. Uh, we as a SAPS, we have not frozen any money. Saps, we do not have any money in our bank accounts. Okay, we haven't attached any assets. We haven't done any of that stuff. So we've got nothing. Fixer will cover their part. Okay, one last question from the lady, and then I'm going to go to the end, and I'll come back. So, so I covered it a bit earlier, but just for your sake, so in terms of the question about Craig Mussain hopping on a plane, okay? So, I, so at this stage, we have not taken Craig Mussain or any party's passports, okay? The prosecutor must decide on the merits of the case that we presented. If they decide that, then yes, we will do that. In terms of the monitoring of flights and the monitoring of movement, that is very much happening. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna to go to some questions. The what? The people's agreement is in March 2020, 2019 states and equity stock loss. Next comment. Okay, so let me just, so the question is about the stop loss and that stuff. Okay, guys, in terms of that stop loss that was happening and stuff like that, okay. Um, f you know, again, that may form part of the misrepresentation, okay, because if there wasn't a stop loss and you were told it was a stop loss, that adds to the misrepresentation. 
When we interviewed and we discussed the matters with the, with the relevant parties, we were told that the stop loss had stopped months ago for whatever reason. That goes against your contract. I'm aware of that. That's a civil matter. Okay. Okay, so, my, so Paul is asking about where is the money and what happened to the, 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 the drop in the income and all that stuff. Again, I want to go back to where the money, we cannot tell you where all the money is. I don't know. And the money that we have found, you must remember something else I just want to point out. It's a bit like a washing machine. The problem is that all your washing is now in this washing machine, in this platform where we've found some, some of your washing. Now I've got to take that washing out and I've got to look at whose money Whose pair of socks, whose shirt, whose underwear, whose pants, and all that type of thing. So we've got to do that, and that gets done forensically. Okay? It's not so simple that we get this money, and then we say, okay, cool, we found the money, now it's going to be paid out to you. Okay? Again, the statutory manager will explain that process to you now. Okay, I'm, guys, I'm going, to, I'm going to cut off there, because I think we need to hand over to Gerard. Okay. Um, just also from my side, guys, I just want, before I hand over to Gerard, I just want to also say that my involvement from the next in the next week or two is going to come down i've got my own business i need to run all of this thing i don't i don't get paid for this and it's not that I'm, just understand where i'm coming from it's taken a lot of time in terms of my practice so i'm gonna i am gonna be cutting back in terms of my role over the next week or two i'm still gonna sit in the background i'll still help where i can but i have a my wife who's sitting here and i've got two little girls at home and i've got a family so there's my wife making this commitment to my wife okay but just please understand so in terms of my involvement till now I, I, i'll still remain anything but in the next two weeks or so my involvement is going to come slightly less because i believe that the case has been presented my job in terms of the pr presentation to the prosecutor i'm i believe is a, a solid case so unless the prosecutor comes and tasks me for something else my part of the investigation will, will come to an end okay Herat, over to you. Thank you very much. And welcome everybody to the FSCA. Sorry we couldn't get the aircon to work. Okay. Um, so you're welcome to take off as much as you like, as long as it stays decent. Um, uh, okay, I'm just gonna go to the slides here. That's not good. Does anybody know how to do that? Yeah, that'll be nice. Thanks. I can start talking so long. So the first thing I want to do tonight is to thank Captain Lars. Um, he's been an absolute driving force in this case, and it's not the first time that we've worked together or that he's worked with one of my teams. Um, he's been absolutely invaluable both uh, with regard to his insight into the case and his unbelievable energy. I'm very happy that I'm not married to him. Um, so thank you, Captain. It's going to be, it's most unfortunate that you can't stay on board, but I do understand uh, that you've got to put bread on the table as well. Before I start, I'd like to introduce my team um, that's working on this case. It's actually two teams. So uh, uh, next to me here is Tante Kile. Sorry, she's, an, Sorry. she's an expert in um, FISE legislation. Uh, I approached her from the FISE ombud. So uh, that's the reason why she's on the team and she's doing all the hard work. Um, Shida Husson over there is my senior manager. Um, we're in the team that, that Tantakile is. So uh, she's also involved in the investigation. Shida has She's been with the FSCA in an investigative capacity for nearly 20 years. And before that, she was a uh, prosecutor as well, so she knows what she's doing. And then um, that is the Presidium Advisory and Presidium Wealth Investigation Team. There's also two external teams that's assisting us with sp specific um, uh, jobs. Um, so just to be clear about that, there's an investigation on our side into Presidium Advisory, the financial services provider, and Presidium Wealth, the juristic representative. There's also an investigation into Imagina FX, 
an unregistered entity in our world. And Jacques Prouvaire has also been here for nearly 20 years. Before that, he was a police officer, is responsible for that investigation. But obviously, the teams are working together. I'd also um, like to introduce our statutory manager, and I'll talk a, a, a bit more about that later on. Um, that's Terence Simon sitting over here with a big mask. Um, so Terence is here if you have any questions that I can't answer. Just been appointed, just started the job, and I'll explain what statutory manager is all about because I think there's also a lot of misunderstanding around that. Okay, um, thanks. So, let's start. I think it's slow, I think it's, okay. Okay, so there's a couple of things happening. Uh, it's not displaying over there. There's a couple of things happening at the same time at the moment, and that could be a bit confusing. So the first thing that you probably know about is that there's an application for voluntary liquidation of Presidium Advisory and Presidium Wealth. So those are the two licensed entities, licensed by the FECA. I say two, but it's really only Presidium Advisory that holds a license. They then appoint a, stat, uh, a juristic representative. Um, as I say, they, they are both in the process of being liquidated. That liquidator has not been appointed yet. That action doesn't come from the FSCA. We do have the powers in some circumstances to bring an application. In this case, we didn't. The application was brought by one of the directors, if I have it correctly, uh, Mr. Kanangan Murat. Okay, then, secondly... Let's check that it's on to do both on... Um, it is there. Try and change it. Uh, yeah. There we go. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. You know what, the other guys, yeah. we can send it to That's them. Fine. Okay. There we go. There we go. The second thing that uh, is happening that we only learned about very, very recently, as Troy mentioned, is that there's an application for the liquidation of Imagine IFX. As I understand it, this is not a so-called friendly liquidation. This is one of the investors that have brought the application. And I understand from the attorney that Mr. Massain, who's part of Imagine IFX, indicated that he wasn't going to oppose the application. I heard about two hours ago that the application was granted. So Imagine our FX is also now liquidated. The next thing um, that's also happening or that already happened, as I said, is that the FSCA has appointed a statutory manager uh, for Presidium Advisory and Presidium Wealth. In other words, the two entities that uh, relate to our licenses. So that is Terence um, Simon over there. And the idea behind the statutory manager, it's, it's not somebody who's going to run around and collect assets and pay, uh, and pay investors out. It's somebody who we put into the company to make sure that there's, there isn't any further misconduct happening. So he will have a veto in terms of paying forward. Terence has already started working. And of course, in this case, his main focus will be actually to find out what happened, who's, uh, who's owed what, and, and to um, deal with bringing money back into the country and back into the company and getting those to the investors. It's not an issue that there's a liquidation and a statutory manager. Those two things can happen at the same time. And it's important for us to have somebody in there that we trust in terms of taking the matter forward. Then, um, you probably also know that the directors of Presidium Advisory and Wealth and the ex-director, Mr. Massain, has all signed an enforceable undertaking with the FECA. So this is a tool that we have, mostly in cases where we think we can save the company. Um, and the undertaking uh, are usually to the effect that they will take certain steps going forward. In the present case, I don't believe, if you see, I don't believe there's any saving of the company. The idea behind this specific enforceable undertaking is that they've undertaken to bring the money back to South Africa. And I'll talk about the money just now. Uh, so you understand that it's an agreement and we have to rely on them to do it. And we certainly hope that they're going to do it. 
And if that happens, that will help Terence a lot in his job. Um, and then the last thing is, um, okay, sorry, I forgot about the, the investigation. Of course, our investigation is ongoing. It's a long process. There's a lot of work still to be done. There's a lot of, lot of work that has been done. Whatever we find, we will share. We, we are sharing with the police and we will share with the police going forward. We will assist the liquidators with it. And of course, we will share with the statutory manager. So as many as possible people can benefit from the forensic work that we're doing. Um, in terms of further investigations, we will be looking at secondary issues. For instance, other people, other financial services providers that sold this product. We will be looking at the representatives that sold this product. As Troy has indicated, um, it's a bit different when we look at them. Um, there's section two in our general code of conduct that says you must always act uh, with due care and diligence in the best interest of your client and in the best interest of the financial markets or the industry. So the question is, were they negligent when they sold these products or were they not? I don't believe, we have no evidence to suggest that they were part of this. Um, but the question is, should they have looked harder? That's something we will look at going forward. And of course, completely different financial services providers um, doing the same thing. Okay, we can move to the next slide if that happens. <coughs> Luckily, there's not a lot of slides. Mm -hmm. Can we ask questions as we go, or do you wait for the, for the I think I'm going to answer a lot of your questions as, as we go along. So let's leave it, leave it until the end. Mm -mm. Oh, there we go. OK. So just a quick rundown of the licenses that's involved in here, the FECA licenses, that because that's our focus, needless to say. Presidium Advisory was an FSP, license was suspended, so they can't trade anymore. Um, Presidium Wealth is a juristic representative of Presidium Advisory, which means that Presidium Wealth can do whatever advisory can do on behalf of advisory. It can't trade in its own name, but it can do it on behalf of, of advisory. Up to 2018, advisory were only authorized for long-term insurance products. So any forex trading that happened up to 2018, we can already say today was illegal, was unregistered business. Um, they didn't have the license at that stage. None of these companies had the license at that stage. Um, okay, then Imagina FX does not have a license. So Imagina FX cannot do a single transaction of any kind a single investment with reference to a financial product ever. Anything that happened there that is financial services, either advice or intermediary services, would be illegal. So that's the basis of our investigation. The CDM license was, was suspended on the 27th of May 2020 when, when we started with the investigation and we saw what was going on. Okay, thanks. Thank you, I don't need that. Oh, excuse, excuse. Oh, okay. So, uh, no, up, back, okay. back, okay. I'm back. Going, I'm going forward now. You're going forward, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. Apologize, I'm a, I'm a bit. Uh, uh, there we go. Okay. There we go. <laughs> That's one. Okay. So I'm going to give you some insight into what we found so far in the investigation. You have to appreciate that I cannot, cannot give you all the detail. We also operate under a, a non-disclosure provision when we do these investigations. Under very specific circumstances, I can get permission to disclose some information. So I'm disclosing to you as much as I can, but there are certain questions we will not be able to answer. Um, okay, so. And also remember that this investigation is ongoing. There's a long way for us to go still. There's a long way for us in terms of finding out what happened to the money. And when I tell you about this flow of funds, um, let me just say one of the tools that we have is an international cooperation agreement with most other regulators in the world. So in terms of that uh, agreement, multilateral memorandum of understanding, we assist them with investigations in South Africa. They assist us with investigations in their jurisdictions. So there are jurisdictions that are very cooperative 
um, uh, and that are very happy to be part of this agreement. And there are jurisdictions that are not so cooperative. And if you find that your platform that you're trading on is one of those jurisdictions that are not so cooperative, that should be a red flag to you already. Okay, so just a quick rundown. Clients funds, and this is just about flow of funds, nothing else. So what you see up here, I'm, I must I stay there? Okay. Okay. okay, no problem. Uh, okay. Presidium Advisor and Presidium Wealth, that's the juristic representative link. Now, the client's funds, as far as we can establish, and some of this is because of our analysis of bank statements, and some of this are because of interviews. So some of this we know for a fact, some of this we still have to verify. Um, client's funds flowed to Presidium Wealth and to Presidium Fund Managers. Is that... Um, that's not Mauritius, eh? That's South Africa. FSP, another FSP. So Presidium Wealth and Presidium Fund Managers. And then most of those funds ended up with Octox in an Octox account, also inside South Africa. From there, some of the funds probably went to, went to Primus Africa. And from there, it landed up at Primus Markets, some of the funds. Um, from Octos, we also found to date that some of the clients' funds went to other clients of Mr. Massain in other entities. And some of the clients' funds went to other platforms. For instance, CM Trading, uh, UK platform. Uh, so we can't, we haven't done a reconciliation. That, that's a really big job. So there's a team working only on that. But that's a big job. What is of great concern are those red arrows. So you will see the funds, clients' funds, going from Presidium Wealth to Octox, back to Presidium Wealth, and back to the clients. So we haven't analyzed that on a big scale yet, on a small scale, but on a small scale, this is one of the patterns. Now we've been given the explanation that if I know I have to pay him tomorrow and he pays me a lot of money today, I'm not going to put it on the platform and then and change it into another currency and then change it back and give it back to him. So what I was doing, I was setting it off. It's a case of set off to make the administration um, easier. That may or may not be the proof. It's of course of great concern for the FECA if we, if we say, see clients being paid with other clients' money. I, I don't have to spell that out for you. Okay, so that's where we are. We need to now, s from there, see where the money went. Okay, let's try the next one. Ah, there we go. We also saw some money leaving South Africa through, um, SA, through a SA Mercantile Bank account in clients' names. And it seems like there's quite a few of them in the room. If I look at the, the heads, the nodding heads, those, trans, those, uh, those monies were transferred out of South Africa with the assistance of Secure FX uh, to accounts in Dubai, Singapore, and what was the last one? It's blocked out here. Uh, Cyprus. Cyprus and Cyprus, okay. Um, some of these funds, some of the clients paid their funds directly into Mauritius Commercial Bank. Well, it seems to be people in the room that did that as well. So that's how some of the, some of the funds went out of the out of the country as well. Okay, we can go to the next one. Then we also saw funds going through Investec bank account in the client's name, and then tra transferred to Capta FX UK, and from Capta FX UK to um, Primus Markets. So there were different ways. So it's gonna take a long time to reconcile all of this to understand what happened to the funds. Okay? So. Um, I'm going to talk to you now about the recovery of the funds, but I first want to just to manage the expectation gap in terms of our investigation. But understand, the purpose of our investigation is to find out who's responsible and to take regulatory action against those persons. If the same information benefits the police, that is great. If the same information benefits um, any of the investors that are busy with civil, civil action, you can apply and you can, can have access to our report. So that, that would also be great. But just in terms of our investigation, 
if we are going to debar people, withdraw licenses, etc., we need to be very, very thorough with what we do. So the process is, 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 on, is on the screen there. And you can see just from the fact that it's such a full slide, this is not something that happens overnight. So we start off getting complaints. We do a preliminary investigation. It's then transferred to full investigation if it, if it deserves to. And then the investigation process starts. There's a lot of tools um, in, in that bucket for us. Interviews under oath, and you can't refuse to do it. Uh, we can get bank statements, sell records, client documents, um, and we can do search and seizure. There was a question earlier about, can we not take, take all the documentation? Um, we do that quite often. We get a warrant from a judge or a magistrate. We go into these premises and we mirror image their computers. We remove their documents, their files, and we build the case from there. We do it quite often. We have those powers. Not doing it in this case because my statutory manager is going to step into the shoes of those companies. And, and there's full cooperation there. There's no issue um, with the directors that stayed behind. Mr. Massain has resigned as a, as a director. Uh, so, yeah. Then, once the investigation is completed, there's an investigation report that I spoke about. Um, and that goes to a meeting, to an enforcement meeting at the FECA to decide what do we intend to do. We then have to give all the parties an opportunity to put their side of the story. We interview them as well, but um, to give us their side of the story, audi altrum partum. That, for that, they have 30 days, and when that comes back, there's a final enforcement decision um, that's, that gets executed. Um, and those, decision are, those decisions are appealable to our financial sector tribunal. And from there, they can take that, if the tribunal agrees with us, they can take it on review to the High Court, to the Supreme Court of Appeal, Sorry. and to, um, of course, to the Constitutional Court, if they're able to. That's why we always talk about the fountains, Bloemfontein and Bramfontein. Okay. So we sometimes end there, we don't always end there. Yes, sir? So I'm looking at the process flow there. How long does that take? That's what I'm it depends from case to case. Um, okay. So we are only interested in the process flow up to finishing the investigation. But th that whole process can take 10 years, it can take five years. Okay, but you've done lots of these before, so give me a gut feel of what you think. No two cases are the same. No two cases are the same. Okay. Okay, so everybody's big question, I understand that, is that will investors get their funds back? Let me start off by saying, I don't know. And it's too early to say, but, I can tell you what we do know. And the first thing, as Captain Lars has indicated, we've not been able to locate substantial funds anywhere. Yet. All your money has gone out of the country. So it's very difficult for us to protect that money if it's outside our jurisdiction. You might have seen in the press a while ago we uh, have another investigation, JP Markets, uh, an outfit in the Cape, also platform forex trading. In that instance, we seized 258 million rand of clients' funds, and it's now safe. And we've now liquidated the company, and those funds will now go to the liquidator to go back to the investors. If you take your money outside the country, we don't have that. We can't do that for you, unfortunately. Um, so um, as Troy has indicated, and as a lot of you know, we are aware of some funds at Primus Markets, but it does not translate to a meaningful cent in the rent. That's the bad news. Yes, sir. So I want to draw a comparison to 2015. I think it was the Kellerman Ponzi scheme. There's uh, some similarities with regards to next one event, funds being transferred to another company, from the director. Yeah. Is there, this, this, from what I mentioned, I noticed on one of the broker's FSP numbers that was linked to the Presidium, um, one of the key individuals that was listed um, on your site um, yeah. happened to be involved with that same company that went through that Ponzi scheme in 2015. So can I just repeat the question for the Microsoft viewers? 
So just quickly before Carrot answers that, for those are listening on Microsoft Teams, Jinwin is asking about a scheme that happened in 2015. It has the same resemblance in terms of the modus operandi, in terms of a black swan event, and in terms of the way it was operated. So the question is basically, in terms of that particular scheme or that particular investigation that was closed off, is, is there any link to this, to the current scheme? Yeah, or for the, the one broker on the FSP yes. number or the Presidium, that individual was involved yeah. in that same yeah. company. So just again, to reiterate for Microsoft yeah. Teams, the key individual, there's a link between the key individual from the case from 2015 and the current matter. Can, can you tell us who you're talking about and which FSP or? Yeah, what I can do is I'll give you an exact copy of the chain of link. Okay. Um, I've got the FSP number, who okay. the person was. Um, I had seen yeah. it before, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I may have given it to Tony Kiel, Mr. Sandler, okay. but oh. I'll be, I've got yeah. it there for. So we'll look at it, but remember that the Kellerman case was closed. In South Africa, we didn't take any action because if anything happened there, it happened outside our jurisdiction. So I, I don't know if it'll have a lot of value for us if, if we can link them. Okay. So the third thing I want to mention is um, the Presidium companies and Imaginar. Um, the funds seem to have been co-mingled and traveled the same road for at least part of the flow of funds. The reason why I mention that, we get a tremendous amount of phone calls a day from investors. And I know about all the horrible stories. And I certainly have a lot of sympathy for that, but there's not much that we can do about that. I mention that because I get a lot of imaginary people phoning and saying, no, I'm sure I'm okay because I didn't go through Presidium. Mm. That's not true, unfortunately. The money went the same way. The money flowed in the same direction. So, you know, if we're going to get money back, um, it will probably have to be shared amongst uh, quite a bigger tool, um, pool, or not us, if, if the liquidator gets money back. As I indicated before, we've seen that some clients have been paid with other clients' funds. We can't make a statement about that yet. We're not yet saying it's a Ponzi scheme, but when you see that in investigation, it is a great concern. And we did get an explanation for it. We're now testing that, in, uh, that, that explanation. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, if the funds flow out the country, you say you've got good working relationship with other regulators. Some regulators. So you mean some will just not help? Some regulators are just not part of the memorandum of understanding. Um, so, you know, you, they don't have to help. Most countries will have to help. So, obviously, we do what we can. But it takes time. Just on that point, in terms of sure. you earlier mentioned with the impossible undertaking that the FSCA has signed with the three directors, that you're relying on them. How is it that you're relying on them? Are they supposed to be giving the information? They're not supposed to be relied on. And what do I do if they don't do it? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So the enforceable undertaking is where you have full cooperation from your financial services provider, and, and he signs the enforceable undertaking. Uh, it's usually in exchange for a bit of leniency. In this case, with all the money outside the country, what's the leverage? How, how will I force them to cooperate? So jail it's, term. it's sorry? Jail. Yeah, jail, jail is not my job. So, um, so that's not the only thing we're doing. We're doing a different things and we're hoping one of that will work. I'm not saying they're not cooperating. It is a process um, with our statutory manager um, in terms of opening a bank account in South Africa to bring the money back and then bringing the money back, et cetera. So that process is ongoing. Um, it hasn't failed yet. I'm just saying I don't want to raise hope because we do have to rely on whoever took the money out of the country to bring it back for now. And of course, linking to that, we've seen the balances. And that's not going to be the answer. If we bring that money back, that's not going to be the answer. Yes, ma'am. You say you have an agreement with certain countries. Can you tell us which of the countries that you have on your list right now you have an agreement with? We have working with 
with in the in the present case yes. with I think just about everybody. Uh, so Mauritius is that included? Mauritius is included, yes. We've got a very good working relationship with Mauritius. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if 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 I see a platform Cyprus, Kiev, those places, I would immediately be very concerned. So yes, sir. Is this, is this far greater than Andrew and Brett? And, I mean, is, are they like middle management? And no. Big, great cloud of Mr. Cunningham Murad was a director of um, Presidium. Presidium Advisory. Uh, Brett was a director of Presidium Advisory. Mr. Massain was a director and of, of, of Imagina. Um, if there is a problem here, they're responsible. So it's not that there's a whole operation going on above their level that's they're just the pawns in the process? No. I don't think so. Surely they should just say bring the money back. Surely they should. <laughs> you reckon they would rather go to jail and spend it much later? No, I don't know that. I can't say that. Are we, <laughs> we in the process of them working with the statutory uh, manager to bring that money back. So uh, they, they are not saying they'll rather go to jail. I'm also not saying they go to jail. I'm just saying that I hope that process works out well. But even if that process works out well, the numbers are not great in terms of what will you get back of your investment. Where's it been spent? Have they just lost it through bad trading or? Well, we don't know that yet. That's the claim. The claim is that these are all trading losses. So we will, we are busy liaising with those overseas regulators that I spoke about to get the trading data on those accounts. And then we will have it analyzed to see whether it's really trading losses. But if it is trading losses, it's massive trading losses. <coughs> Um, then, then I, I mean, then I don't know what you were doing, which also brings me back, which also brings me back to the question that was raised earlier about how can this be possible if there was a stop loss? I completely agree with that question, and and with the with the fact that it's difficult to believe. I, I suppose everybody in the room knows how a stop loss works. You put a percentage on it, eight percent up, eight percent down, and then you get out of the position. So it shouldn't be possible to lose 40 or 60 percent of your investment if you have a stop loss in place. This was one of the presentations made to the clients that the stop loss is in place. If it wasn't in place, that's a problem. So in a couple of months, we will be able to tell you whether this was trading losses, really trading losses, or whether something else happened. But all those arrows you saw earlier, sir, we have to follow that arrows further. So there's got to be quite a number of slides added to this presentation before this investigation is over. And this is the phase outside the country. This is the phase that takes long because you have to approach the other, uh, the foreign regulator. They will have to decide they are going to help you because there's a lot of ticks. And then they must get the information, give it back to us. And then we we'll look at it, we say, well, now we want more information based on this. Then we're going to go back to them and get the more information and so forth. It's not like an, uh, an investigation in South Africa where my investigators can just run with it one on top of the other. If I get, see the money going to his bank account, I get his bank account. If I see from there it went to his bank account, I get his bank account. So it's a little bit different, takes time. Who pays for it? Investors or does government, this government sponsor? The, the, the investigation. The investigation. We, the FECA, are funded by levies on the industry. It's not government sponsored and the investors don't pay for it. So we are funded by levies. And out of those levies, um, the enforcement division at the FECA are responsible for doing all the investigations. So it doesn't come off the investors and it doesn't, doesn't come from government either. Yes, sir. I know it's a bit of a moot point not new funds, but I mean, the funds are invested were all from the UK to Mauritius, so nothing ever came to South Africa, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. But irrespective of that, the plan is to bring the money back to South Africa. Who was, who, who was the financial services provider that you dealt with? I think that's the important question. Um, well, it's um, 
Imagine if Trading International Limited trading as Brazilian wealth, which is a bit of a confusion. I don't know if you can help me. Where, where do they fit in? It's, I think it's Mauritius. So it's Mauritius. Okay. So everything I invested is from UK. Into so, Mauritius. yeah. So look, I shouldn't give you legal advice, um, but my guess would be that um, you should look to the Mauritius company for your for your funds because they were your service provider. I'm I'm assuming that this room is full of clients of Presidium Wealth and Presidium Advisory and Imagina FX. So you might be in a different situation. I don't know. But it is Andrew Cunningham. Yeah. It's not about the persons. It's about with whom did you have a financial services provider agreement? Who was your investment manager, so to speak? So you'll have to look into that very carefully and maybe speak to an attorney about that because you might be completely outside this loop. Or it might be just a case of uh, uh, irrelevant letterhead and actually your, your funds went through. Yeah, um, well it is, uh, because it's trading as Brazilian wealth, which is a South African entity. Yeah, but you so can't really trade as another company. It must be a trading name, so the, I don't know. The Mauritian company has been uh, listed as the funds yeah. for several years. Yeah. Like five years. Um, yes, ma'am. So that, just in terms of that, that just coming back mm -hmm. from, a, from, from a police perspective, that's part of the misrepresentation. Because uh, you, you were led to believe that, that the trading was happening on that particular company, which is defined exactly that, which is the definition of fraud. So Tandikile has just made a very good point. She's pointed out to me that most of the agreements actually read the way yours read. Um, but the question she pointed out is that who's the advisor or representative that assisted you? Andrew Cunningham. Andrew Cunningham himself. So he's a representative of Presidium Advisory. Um, so one can assume that he acted on behalf of Presidium Advisory, who's acting on behalf of Presidium. Well, uh, sorry, no, who's the FSP actually? Yeah, yeah. So you know, the fact that your funds went elsewhere may or may not be relevant. It's it's a good idea for you to actually get advice on that. Okay. Yes. Sure. You want to repeat? So, okay, so the, the question is what do we know about Presidium Global and Presidium in, in Mauritius? Okay, you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, we are aware of Presidium Global Holdings. They have the same directors, which is Andrew Cunningham Moritz, uh, Brett Bukes, and Craig Massain. Um, these are Mauritian, this is a Mauritian, it's like a Cayman Island entity. Um, it is a, a fund administrator of the Presidium Global Fund. Okay, so it's registered in the Cayman Islands. Um, some of the agreements are with Presidium Global Holdings. So you'll find on the cover of your agreement, Presidium Global Holdings entering into an agreement with the client. Do some of you have those types of agreements? Memorandum of Understanding, yeah. MOA. It's, it's got the Presidium logo on it and it says Presidium yeah. Global Holdings yeah. and the client. Yeah, Some the majority of clients. Right. So there, the, the, um, your agreement may have been with Presidium Global Holdings, but the financial services was rendered either by was rendered by Presidium Advisory or through the juristic representative, which is Presidium Wealth. So then that would also fall under our jurisdiction because the person who assisted you is um, working for the FSP that we're looking after. So, so if I can summarize, so attending Keeley, you said for the guys on Microsoft team, with that whole structure of global and, and in the Cayman Islands, it's all great, but the advice came from a South African registered entity under FSP, and therefore it's under the jurisdiction of FIXA. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. The Presidium Mauritius Managed Fund um, is not a fund. They, they called it a Presidium Mauritius Managed Fund. So we've verified with the Cayman Islands um, and it's not a, an actual approved fund. Um, it was, that is basically an investment in Imagina FX, in the, tra in the trading platform. It, Presidium Mauritius Managed Fund doesn't exist, basically. Yes. Okay. okay. Guys, we're going to have to start to... Can, can I make a suggestion? 
can we all just... the all the questions that you guys sent in we've got them on screen at about four or five slides let's go through them quickly and and let's see what yes. how many questions are actually left after that is that okay with everybody okay so the <laughs> Whenever you're at your house, it's open. <laughs> <laughs> so the first, the, uh, so we, we kind of grouped them, um, some of the questions together. Are the Presidium and Imagina processes combined or being managed separately? From FSCA point of view, I've explained that we have two investigations, but of course, we're all talking to each other. Um, the next question I think has been answered. Uh, I can't give you numbers, but we know where some of the funds are. The next question, why has Craig not been arrested? I think that has been dealt with by Captain Lars. The next one is, are the various legal entities all going to be liquidated? So I've given you a status update of the different liquidations. None of them by the FECA in this case. We sometimes do do it, but not in this case. Um, we are also aware of the fact that our statutory manager is stepping in. So, you know, that helps us. Um, when were the funds frozen and were they frozen in all locations? So the only funds that were frozen was the, f the funds that was with Primus Markets. And it wasn't frozen in the sense as, as we would talk about it. So police can sometimes freeze funds um, with the help of the asset forfeiture unit. We sometimes work with the asset forfeiture unit. Um, to get such funds frozen and with the Financial Intelligence Center. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, so in the present case, it was frozen um, because of a fallout between the directors. And it was agreed that, fu that funds will remain there until that has been um, sorted out. And Primus Marcus are honoring that. So it's not frozen as, as as we usually, as you would usually imagine we do. Can I just maybe on that, Harold, is in sure. terms of with the directors not having an agreement and, uh, and uh, Primus actually saying that they were going to not Oh, sorry, thank you. Tr transactions. Okay. I just want to make clarity about that. So Primex Costa, there was a, there was a disagreement between the directors of, of basically Craig and Andrews. Okay, and because of that thing, Primus then, they themselves said that they weren't going to do anything with that particular transactions or the money. It wasn't the case, I just want to make this crystal clear, that the <coughs> SAPS or that fixer gave an instruction to any platform okay. to freeze anything, because I want to say that because that was what was said on the portal. So that's one, just making sure that you have a crystal understanding. Fixer did not send a legal instruction to free, am I correct, Carol? Correct. For any platform to freeze any money. Okay. In this case. Could we hold them responsible if they lost further funds after supposedly this Yes. Yes. Who? Um, uh, Primus so Markets. Oh. Yeah. These funds were actually yeah. in dispute. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunately too uh, far into legal advice for, for me to comment on. Uh, but that's something you can look into. Then the last question on this slide is uh, we understand the statutory manager has been appointed. It's not for Imagina, it's for the two presidium companies. Um, and the proposed timelines. So Terence has already started working very hard on it um, and he's been flying across the country as well um, to try and stop the hemorrhaging. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a full-time job for him at the moment. There's no way we can give you timelines on that. Uh, what can we expect in terms of getting any funds returned? I think we've dealt with that. How will the statutory manager ensure that the process is fair and that no investors are shown preference? Terence, you want to take that? You want me to answer? Yeah. No, I'm happy to, happy to take that. Stand here when you answer, you don't mind Terence, so the Microsoft Teams goes. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's essentially my role is, is, to, is to find any funds, um, assist getting them back, facilitate getting them back, and then um, find the records and based on actual evidence that I can that I can get hold of, and then maybe at the funds and, and send it back to this one. Um, send it back to, to, to the investors. I do that in collaboration with Fisco, so Fisco holds me account, um, as well as obviously the auditors that come in afterwards, and as the, 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 these companies are being liquidated, there will also be a liquidator involved 
have been there are making sure that um, the correct proceedings are going on. So that's essentially in a nutshell, you've got zillions of eyes on this thing, um, making sure that uh, the right scent goes to the right pocket. Sorry, and I can add to that, sorry, sorry. Uh, I can add to that that we appoint statutory managers only on the basis that they are completely independent and they have absolutely no interest um, in the case. So there's no reason for my statutory manager to uh, be biased towards any group, um, except if they offer him a lot of money. <laughs> Sorry, Troy. Now, then just in terms of, just in terms of, uh, I know a lot of people are concerned about the, the influence of the liquidator. Okay, so with the statutory manager, that 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 takes some of that risk away. Okay. Yes. The other thing also is in terms of the liquidation. So if you speak to any attorney, okay, they'll explain to you that there's a process. You can't. It's not that Craig was saying can appoint his own liquidator and have a separate arrangement with him that they're busy ciphering money off to the side. The liquidator is held accountable to the investors. Okay. And if he's found to be not doing his job, there's a process involved and that person can be debarred or whatever you want to call it. So the, the next thing is how will the strategy manager find all the investors? That was actually answered previously from the, from the audience. Um, the moment Terence has access to all the systems, the record should be there. But of course, that same records will be available to the liquidator. And it will be the liquidator's job to make sure that everybody puts in a claim. I've heard an argument a couple of days ago, after two hours on the phone, that these are clients' funds, it's kept separate, it's not commingled with the funds of the company, so um, there shouldn't be a problem because it's completely separate, it's not even part of the liquidation, um, it should just go back to the clients. If the matter was handled correctly and the clients' funds were kept separate, that might have been true but you know that it wasn't the case. Surely, let me, let me run through, okay. okay. We'll come back, Wayne, we'll just finish the questions and we'll come back to you. Um, How will the investors be notified? I have no idea. That's the liquidator's job. What happens when payments were made by Craig but don't reflect on the accounts held by the custodians? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm gonna answer that if, if Mr. Massain may, and I'm, I'm assuming this question is because it happened. If that happened and we don't know about it, um, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. If the liquidator and the statutory manager don't know about it, there's nothing they can do about it. However, if that is discovered, those clients is gonna have a problem because they've received proceeds of crime. So, so not only will they lose those, those uh, preference payments, but they might have uh, their own issues with, with the authorities then. Several investors receive commissions for referrals. Will these be treated the same as actual investments? I don't know what, is that, is the person who asked this question, is, is he in the room? So if I can interpret, sorry, how it's yeah. what the guys are saying is that some, what happened was some of the people were referring people and, and they were getting commissions, commissions yeah. for those referrals. So in terms of that, does that get seen as a claim for them from an investment perspective? Oh. My answer would, be, and I could stand to be corrected, is that uh -huh. the claim is only based upon money that you physically put in. A referral fee, in terms of a commission, is not the capital. And the, I don't know, strategy money we talking maybe that's where, that's where, uh -huh. the, where the question's coming from. Oh, I see. Okay, no, we, 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 we can't answer that because that will be a legal question for the liquidator and, and the statutory manager. from the, the um person doing the trade like Alan or whatever yeah. from his account to yeah. the other person's account. So we won't know what, how that's going to be treated, but I would imagine that the liquidator and the statutory manager will do everything in their power to give preference to investors' funds being returned. I, I think just in terms of the liquidation, what we'll probably do is, like we've had a meeting here with Fixer, I will try and organize a meeting with maybe with the liquidator via Microsoft Teams, and they can then answer the legal questions in terms of the liquidation, if that's easier. Because each department can only answer in terms of, so Fixer can only answer in terms of their roles, except from ours, so maybe we can do that to answer the questions. Here. Okay, let's rock and roll. What will happen to Craig's personal assets? Um, I don't know what will happen to Craig's personal assets, but um, we have this concept of proceeds of crime in South Africa. So 
um, in a, in a, as part of a prosecution, the asset forfeiture unit can follow proceeds of crime and recover that, needless to say. Liquidator can follow assets um, if he believes there is a claim against Mr. Masaini or any other director. So, um, yeah, there's certainly some, some room there for recovery, uh, but I can't say more than that at this stage. Will the process focus on Craig or, Craig or his co-conspirators too? My process is focused on uh, the, the FSP and the juristic representative and the unregistered business by uh, FX. Imagine. Imagine FX. FX. And the people who are responsible for any misconduct in those companies. That's my process. I don't know if you want to add, but police process. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so I've already covered in terms of the police process. Any any part any party that is found to have done misrepresentation, I, I mentioned it earlier, intentionally, okay, will be looked at or will, and will be prosecuted. We have to present a case. I just want to go back to the the part of the intent. Okay, so staff members, the guy that sold you the fund, I'm just going to say Darren as an example. Okay, Darren was under the impression that it was a legitimate business. I can't then, I have to show that Darren knew that it was not illegitimate and he had the intent um, and he was misrepresenting because it means that he, by misrepresentation, I have to prove that he was aware that it was not what it was. Okay, and that's any party. That's not, I'm not limited to a director, to whoever it is, it's any party that I can prove that case. What about the sort of million a month Darren being paid? Commission? So, yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of commissions and stuff like that, it doesn't mean that's not misrepresentation. Okay, the guys with any fees. Another question I'm also asked is that in terms of the, the you know, the, the commissions and people paying back and fall back and all sorts of stuff, again, that's going to be a legal aspect in terms of from a liquidation perspective and that, but you must remember that there's cost of running the business, salaries, whatever it is. So, you know, all of those things, that's on the liquidation side, they need to look at it from a criminal aspect. Okay, receiving money as a salary or as a commission is not a crime. But it might be proceeds, proceeds of It may be. It may be, yes, sure, you're right. Sure, but that, that just means from an asset forfeiture perspective, okay, so the asset forfeiture attaches goods that are proceeds of a crime, okay, but it's not the case of fraud. And, yeah. and you must remember something else with the asset forfeiture unit. Asset forfeiture unit doesn't necessarily have to have a conviction of guilty to be able okay. to attach goods. Chapter 5, yeah. Okay, so please remember that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Sorry, from your prosecution, um, you know, what, I know you said you're prosecuting now and not for that. So you must remember they've got to face a court process. So the prosecutor <laughs> looks at the looks at the merits of the case. They then go through. So we have to present the merits of the case to the prosecutor. The prosecutor needs to look at the case, and that's what they're doing. They basically, if you want to call it, doing a due diligence on the case at the moment. So they've got meetings with folks that look at all the evidence that's been processed. They will then give us an instruction to detain. So what will happen is if they, if they issue a warrant of arrest, it means that they believe they want to prosecute that person. That person then gets a warning statement, gets arrested, and there's a process for bail and everything like that, and then we start the prosecution in terms of a trial. The judge will then decide on, on, in terms of bail, no bail on all that type of thing, that's for the courts to decide. But if from, a pro, from a prosecution perspective, the prosecutor will start the, by, the first part is to do the warning statement, charge the person and to register a, a court date and sit with the defense attorneys and start that. And that's a whole process. I do want to tell you in terms of managing the expectation, we live with a very slow judicial system. It's not something that's going to happen next week. In terms of my, my, my guideline, more or less, is that this thing will take at least six months before it starts to actually trial fully in terms of effect. That's what average happens. It's always well to tell you this because what happens is you apply, you've got to argue the evidence that has to be submitted. It was, it, the defense has to have the uh, evidence that's presented. You have to, in terms of who gets charged and everything else and what, who, whether they have legal aid and attorneys and those are, those are things that need to be done before the trial actually starts. Okay. So what are the specific charges for that? Is it just the representation? Fraud. Fraud is through the misrepresentation. Okay. Can we come to the question? Let's just finish and I know okay. you've got lots there and I'm sorry I have to, you're the one I always have to pick on about. Come, let's just finish up. Okay, so on. the next question is about timelines that, that and I'm assuming this refers to timelines of, of recovering money that, that is, uh, I can't answer. What really took place with regards to the Presidium investment causing the current situation? <clears throat> that is some, that is what we, the investigation is about. That's what we need to find out. 
Was it really trading losses or um, was it something else? Uh, what caused our investments to decrease so rapidly? Stop loss principle, I agree, it shouldn't have happened. The black swan event, um, I, I agree with Troy, I can find no merit in, 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 that, in that story, uh, especially not if there was supposed to be a stop loss uh, principle in place. And when things like this happen, you also look at what happened to the rest of the market. And you compare what happened to the rest of the market. <clears throat> Who's currently holding the Presidium Investor Funds? So the little we know is at Primus Markets. What currency are these funds being held in? According to the statements that we received from Primus Markets, there are some in Euro and some in um, dollar, US dollar. What steps should we be taking to claim our funds back? Um, you should get into contact with the liquidator. Uh, what percentage? We don't know. <laughs> Um, how long is it possible for this process to go on before we see our investments? Well, that, that we certainly don't know. And that's, of course, on the assumption that you see your investments. Uh, Do you have any partial payments sometime, a first payment and a final dividend? Or yeah. I don't know, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've no idea, sir. I've never done a liquidation. <laughs> uh, is there anything we can do to expedite the process? I don't think so, but we do appreciate the assistance that you are giving in terms of yeah. our investigation. Just in terms of that, so I think in terms of what is going to be very crucial to liquidate, to SAPs, to anything else, is the proof in terms of the transaction that took place. Okay. So all whether it's whether it's fixed, whether, whether it's SAPs or whether it's a liquidator, they're going to ask you to be able to provide proof of your transactions, the amount that you transferred from what bank account to what bank account, so those type of information. The other thing also just from from an invest from a from previous perspective is it's the capital you invested, not the interest or the dividend or the growth, it's what you put in that needs to be focused on. The next question is yours, but I think it's been answered. And the last question it's the last question? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's been so. answered already. Okay. No, wait, more. Oh no, there's more. Sorry, <laughs> just hang on. <laughs> So look, I can just tell you from my, from my experience, and again, I'm not a liquidator, we'll have a chat to the liquidator, okay? But in terms of a claim, okay, um, work from our perspective, from an investing perspective, I want to see the, the transaction that you made yes. and what went in. No, it's about what you invested, uh, and it needs to be determined still whether the black swan event and the drawdown is real. So you, know, you shouldn't pay attention to that. You should work on what did you invest. Is the investigation team working with any international agencies? So we've covered that. What charges have the aforesaid gentlemen been charged with? They haven't been charged yet. Um, they are investigating fraud, the police. The FECA are investigating unregistered business and um, misconduct around behavior as an FSP, a representative, etc. So our um, statutory laws have been, we, we are seeing whether our statutory laws have been uh, contravened. So we can investigate an allegation of a breach of any financial sector law. Those are the laws that we work with. Um, how come Mercantile sent me this proof of trade for the last investment deposited to <coughs> Presidium showing dollars buying rate? Should we be investigating Mercantile and secure FX as well? Um, I don't think that we are going to investigate mercantile and secure FX. I don't know about you, Troy. No, so from, look, from our perspective, I mean, that those, those trades with the mercantile and things like that, we're obviously going to pursue and look if, they, if they're actually genuine statements, okay? The liquidator and the statutory manager will, look, will do follow the money, okay? But one thing is that we are looking at is in terms of the actual statements that were provided, if they were genuine or not. Because it is concerned because we are aware of some documentation not being correct. Do we see, do we see mercantile statements? Yeah. We did get bank statements. Bank statements, oh, okay. So the person who sent in this, this question, who received a mercantile statement, can that person please contact the investigation team? Because um, you, I assume... Yeah. Not that I was the, the person that asked, asked the question, but I've got exactly the same scenario. 
Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We look into that. I mean, that makes it a good question about what's mercantile's role in it. Um, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, what was PDM's intention behind the Black Swan event? I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> uh, are the directors planning and intending to pay the investors back? So as you know, there's an enforceable undertaking and the idea is that some of the money should come, or the money should come back to South Africa so it can be given back to the investors and let's hope that's the way it works out. Are the statements on our trading accounts fake? Um, <laughs> my best answer, my, the proper answer for me to give on behalf of the FSCA is it's under investigation. <laughs> but um, if your trading statements say that you still have a lot of money left somewhere, I'd find it difficult to believe. Uh, okay, that one we can skip. Can PDM be forced to honor the agreement? Yes and no. What percentage of the available funds will be consumed by this? Yeah, they can, they, if we had leverage over them, if we could say to them, if you don't do this, we're going to withdraw your license, then certainly yes. But when this investigation is finished and just with what we know today, how could the FECA not withdraw this license? I can't say to them, bring the money back and then my yeah. divisional executive won't withdraw your license. But isn't that tied to like, what, what SAPS is supposed to be doing in terms of you saying this is what's happening from an FSC point of view? Hmm. Well, how does it not get transferred to SAPS? So, that SAPS so it does, it does, but it doesn't mean that's a what exactly that's, a, that's why we work in conjunction because a lot of the investigation is duplicate. Okay, so the information, because they're not investigating the fraud stuff, but in terms of the information and that stuff that they provide for us, then goes towards the fraud case. But just having a fraud case doesn't force them to honor an agreement. Okay, and the question is about, can the PDM be forced to honor the agreement? Okay, and at this stage, you know, if you look at your agreement, your agreement says that th there's 18%. There's a lot of things that we can discuss about your agreement, which is not there. Okay, so, you know, so... You know, there's certain, I, I think in terms of the, the, what parts of the agreement, to be honored, is, is it, it's difficult to, because what parts of the agreement, in terms of the regulator, which they have to abide by, there's certain things that the regulator can force them to do, okay? But in terms of being forced and to, to make, to honor, to make your payment, that's why you've got attorneys involved on the civil side and the litigation in terms of liquidation. But if they haven't got the money, then how are you going to force them to pay you back the money? So we, we have FECA, have many cases where we, we, there's enough reason for people to honor the enforceable undertaking. And we will always give that priority to get clients' funds back. But not all cases are like that. Um, if the money is out of the country, um, wh why would you bring it back? But if they have signed that enforceable undertaking, yeah. I mean, can't you go to them now and tell them and say, if, if you're serious, bring back the money now. We're in that process. We, in we're busy with that process. That's the statutory yeah, manager's so process, they, yes. Uh, they, they, they yeah, so I'm, not, so, so I'm not saying we've abandoned that, yeah, yeah. and it might still happen. I, I'm just replying, replying to can we be forced yeah, they're not cooperating to... With you guys. Yeah. They're no, not so, no, sorry, I just want to answer a question. You must remember, I said yeah. they're not cooperating with me. I didn't say they're not cooperating with Fixer. Can I ask the question yeah. then? Are okay. they cooperating with Fixer? Yes. Right. They've been interviewed. They've been, we, we're in contact with the attorneys. They've signed the enforceable undertaking. Um, they they've agreed <laughs> to the appointment. <laughs> they've agreed to the appointment of a statutory manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, they haven't brought back the money. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. That's a process. That's a process. Okay, so let's see how f f quick we can f finish this. Yeah, what, percentage? Uh, what percentage will be consumed by the statutory manager, admin fees, etc.? I don't know about the admin fees, and I certainly don't know what the liquidation costs will be, which is probably a bigger issue. The statutory manager has a reasonable fee um, that uh, is agreed upon and that is cleared with the FECA, so that's not a great concern. I just want to reiterate again, uh, Carrot already covered how the fees work. It's covered from the levy. So the statutory manager, am I correct? No, the statutory manager is paid by the company. Okay. Can you no. ask how much that is? 
I actually don't know as I stand here today. Yeah, so. your <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next one is, is so if it's... Out of the company, if there are funds, of course. So the statutory manager is also working on his own risk. Is FECA SAPS lodging criminal and civil case? We're not lodging any civil case, we're taking um, administrative action. So that's the withdrawals, the debarments, um, penalties, hopefully successful enforceable undertaking, etc. Um, SAPS' job is the criminal investigation and NPA's job is the criminal prosecution. Will it be feasible for investors to lodge a separate private investigation and a separate class action? Can't give you legal advice, but um, I don't see why you will not have access if you go through the correct channels to our report. But of course, it's always open to, invest to investors to do their own investigation. If, so there's a process in terms of that, um, in terms of uh, PAIA, uh, access to information. You have to apply to our information officer. And um, I think, mo it's not my decision, but most likely you will have access to that. So you can get your information officer's information from time to get Yeah, but remember, you're not gonna get a report before the report hasn't been finalized. Okay. Yeah. Before we get to you, Sandra. But it's also on our website. It's also on our website. Before we get to Sandra, I know you've got a question, but poor Wayne in the corner, every time he wants to raise his hand, I tell him we're going to come to him at the end. So if you don't mind, Sandra, can we just go to Wayne, give him the opportunity, and then I'll come back to you. Okay, I just want to know that. I've got like two or three here quickly. <laughs> um, you're talking about some of the funds were then registered as uh, dollar denominations in Cyprus. But now, if ever there's like funny involvement with regards to the dollar, usually the Federal Reserve has jurisdiction in there. So is that not like some kind of a pressure tactic you could put on there with regards to involving the... Federal Reserve? The Federal no, it's Reserve, about the US, US. and Fed, oh. the IRS and... Oh, okay. Federal Reserve, US. US, yeah. Yeah. Does that have jurisdiction where... But we don't have in money in the US? The dollar. No, because so the money was in US. In oh, because it's not... You know, I don't know. So, 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 so let me weigh in this and let me address that. So there is already a case that's been registered with the securities or whatever it is, the equivalent of the regulator in the States, as well as federal pursuit in terms of federal charges. Okay, because money was involved in Wells Fargo in a U.S. bank account and left the U.S. jurisdiction. It's not about the U.S. dollar. So in terms, just because something's in domination of U.S. dollar. So as an example, if you invest in Alan Gray Orbis U.S. dollar denominated fund in Guernsey or whatever it is, doesn't necessarily mean that the IRS or the federal government gets involved. Where the U.S. government gets involved from wire fraud and that type of thing is when the transactions occurred in a U.S. jurisdiction, as would it be here. So from that perspective, there is already a, a, a that's already happening on the U.S. side. But that, yeah. So my understanding was that um, wherever the dollar is used anywhere in the world, if it's being used for fraudulent representation, they have jurisdiction automatically over it. So, so look, we can't comment because we're not the Federal Reserve, but I can, I can tell you that in terms of from a federal investigation perspective, there is a complaint already in the U.S. It's just uh, the other one is just so okay. uh, quickly with regards to the brokers. Um, what about the brokers being aware of um, Frank's previous liquidation? Okay, again, because you must remember being aware of somebody's history is not a criminal effect. It comes back to the transaction, okay, in terms of being aware in terms of that. Um, and then I, I think we need to head towards another, to the back there just now. But no. So, yeah. I'm just thinking from a disclosure point of view, should that not have been highlighted? Yeah, but you must remember the disclosure is to the reps. To, it's not towards saying, you know, in other words, my disclosure letter is about my qualifications, about my stuff, not about other people within the company, okay? Because you're dealing with me. Am I correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. But on your forward with regards to um, where there's benefits or interest that's going to be declared by directors of the company, yep. they'll declare, obviously, where they've got shares in other businesses, etc., etc. Oh. Surely there, there should have been some kind of a disclosure at that point in time with regards to previous liquidation. No, that's not an interest. The interest that, that the um, FECA Code of Conduct speaks about is where you have a financial interest and you're putting your client's money in that company. So typically, if I'm the representative and I take your money and I put it with, uh, with an investment company where I, I have a stake in, in, in whatever form, 
that's the type of disclosure and conflict of interest that, that our legislation speaks about. Okay. okay. Sorry, just the last one quickly. Medium uh, <laughs> Global, um, you're talking about going back to the Cayman Islands. Uh, so that was like a shell forwarding company. That shell forwarding company with that return address goes back to a Cape Town address, which is also linked to that other Brazilian company in Cape Town. Um, their technical data sheets is very similar to the technical data sheets and the returns are Brazilian PDM wow. So if you're referring to, you, when you're referring you to the, the, not the other presidium, the, not the other presidium. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, that's okay. right. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is. So let me just. I, I can't remember the name now, but let me just make it clear. There is a presidium capital. Uh, capital I think. Yeah, if financial services provider in South Africa, they've got nothing to do with this. I think they were in fact the complainant, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. they they were the. And yeah. Okay, so we'll look at that, but uh, we haven't picked up anything, um, any link uh, between those two companies. But you know, we'll definitely look into that. Thanks a lot. Well, no, Maybe. Ago, there was a big like, yeah. fraud scandal with regards to what is it, the ex CEO of MTN as well. He was taken for like hundred something million. Yeah. Then. Can I ask you? After the meeting, just to give that detail to Tantikil, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Do you want to maybe just... I send out, I know I promise you, but I just can we just go back to the back and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, Tantikil, a high-level quickly overview from what I'm seeing here yeah. in the NCAA. I think maybe if you can just maybe introduce yourself so it wouldn't okay. you Sorry. Yeah, I'm Brandon Topham. I'm in charge of the enforcement division of the NCAA. So I sort of think from a high-level point of view, we're very upset because one of our own has effectively done this. So we've got a very personal interest in this. We say to the public the whole time, don't do business unless you deal with a registered person. Right? But obviously, even when you're doing business with a registered person, you've got a very good chance of, of um, picking a, a bad apple. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So from our side, we will throw all our resources into, into this case to come up with um, usable reports that we can give to the police, etc. Where I'm looking at it from, there's only one of three possibilities. I look at the end product, all right? Either the money is sitting somewhere, we don't know where it is at this point in time, in which case, well, that's gonna be good. Two, the money's gone. And if the money's gone, there's one of two choices. One, either you guys were in forex trading, which I feel every single matric student, please stop being forex traders because it's a high risk investment. So it could be because of that. Or two, it's because of fraud, all right? In which case, we will do what we can to find out what happened to that money. So that includes tracing it if it goes into a Bitcoin account somewhere, etc. The problem comes in, in jurisdiction. So while we can write a letter to FNB and say, give us this detail, we can't write a, to the Bank of Bul uh, Bulgaria and say, please give us this information. That takes years sometimes <laughs> to follow up, and that's where the liquidate. My only concern here listening at the back of the room is there seems to be more than one liquidate. So I'm just hoping that the liquidators aren't going to be fighting on different sides. So I can only urge everybody, uh, make sure your liquidators start to speak to each other so they can act as one. We will then work with the liquidator to write professional letters of demand to wherever we locate assets and try and recover it that way and make sure it gets into a so liquid, it will be a liquidation. The abyss has already started, so it's simple. And there's certain rules in liquidation, which means your money will be paid out pro rata. You don't have to worry about that. From, uh, from the um, expertise of the FECA, I think we've got really good forensic investigators. We probably have one of the best forensic teams in the country. Um, so I don't think you have to worry too much about that. We will, we will get the report, not as fast as I would like it to be, but it'll, it will be done. People know they called me Nike yesterday. Let me just do it yesterday. So there's a lot of pressure on the team to, to get it as quickly as possible. The biggest problem, once again, is even when you're working with offshore jurisdictions, and I meet with uh, other regulators from around the world every quarter, it takes time. You know, every, uh, and if you look at probably the biggest fraud case in South Africa's history, that happened four years ago, three, four years ago, nobody's been arrested there yet. And that's, you know, we call it complainant number one. So it's not that easy to get somebody arrested in South Africa, but in this case, we seem to have a very active police presence uh, in the case, which is a really good start in, in, in any case. So the bottom line is it's either it's fraud or it's, uh, 
a, a loss of trading. Um, but on both those two options, there's no money either way, unless we can find out where that money went to. And we will, from our side, do what we can to find out where the money went to so we can identify tell the liquidator who can then write letters of demand. And this is, so from a pure practical point of view, been in fraud for many years, don't expect to be paying Christmas presents this year with any money you invested in any of these entities. Uh, it's gonna take a couple of years before you see anything, um, if you see anything from that point of view. But we will, we take it very personally. Um, unfortunately, most of our, uh, the, the things that are available to us is obviously to take them out of business, but in this case, they're already taken out of business. Um, and the other is that gentleman there, Jacques, um, he, one of his primary jobs is to work with the police and the prosecutor every single month to follow up on the cases across the country. So we have a very personal interest in, in helping the police. And we say to them every month, do you need something? because we don't run with budgetary limits, et cetera. Whatever they need, we will find it to help their, their, their case going forward. Going back to the enforceable undertaking, why that is so important is because we don't know who was involved if there was fraud, okay? So the people that have said they want to help us bring the money back is good. We're gonna work with them as much as possible because whatever they can help us find is gonna make the case um, against them uh, easier as such, you know, to, if they helping us cooperate, it's going to be in their best interest. So I'm still hoping that on the enforceable undertaking side, you get the money back because it's much easier to get money back from Belize, let's say, I don't know who that country was until the other day. Um, <laughs> if the people that are signatories theoretically tell you to, to send the money back, and if they're not telling you to send it back, then you've got to go through a whole court process, even in that country potentially with the liquidator to be acknowledged there, et cetera. So that's why enforceable undertaking is really important and why the people that have said they're gonna help us, they've got a lot at, at stake as well. All right. Okay. Sandra, I know you've got questions. Sorry, thank you. So can I just add to what Brandon has said? I've introduced all the liquidators to each other. So I've, I've made sure that they all know about each other and um, that they work together as much as possible. So it's in their hands. Okay. So th there's two liquidations. One for prison. On the basis of the liquidator, we don't have our statute to remanage and handle that process of appointing the liquidator. So, no, you can't appoint the liquidator. The court must appoint the liquidator and the master. But the statutory manager is a, is a, is a step that we took um, to try and safeguard whatever there is. So the liquidation process wasn't the FECA, and we can't stop them from doing that. They... they no, um, investors are, are entitled to do that. But I have the undertaking from the liquidators that they'll be working with my statutory manager. Okay, and to Sandra, sorry, I know you, you had a question. So just, so just so I can repeat the question, basically summarize, sorry, Sandra, so the guys on Microsoft Teams, is that if the liquidation is opposed, can the statutory manager get involved in the process, basically, rather than, than the, the appointed liquidator? That's the question. The statutory manager can run that process, um, but the company has been liquidated. Yeah, okay, but they, they, yes, but they quite, quite far down that process. Um, imagine I was liquidated today and the rest is quite far down the process. So uh, the statutory manager will certainly play a, a big role in it, um, no doubt. Given how Yeah, so again, for Microsoft Teams, so that it would, that it's been raised that it would be easier as having one liquidator. In an ideal world, yes. But you must remember that in terms of from liquidation process, never mind any, let's take Edcon as an example. I'm just using Edgar's, okay? Any creditor has a right to a file for a liquidation process. So any, and, and that's what's happened. What are the investors has, has applied for, for the liquidation of Presidium? The other one is voluntary done. And I just want to also reiterate why the, uh, 
uh, why in terms of the proceeding was voluntary done. There wasn't any hidden agenda or anything in terms of it. I just want to explain something to you is that because the undertaking, the enforcement side had to get the signatures and to get those signatures was just taking very long. So the, 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 the remaining directors decided then to do, file for liquidation to help assist with the process. So, yeah. Okay, guys, I think let's start to ask, let's start to go through questions. I'm going to come back to you now, ma'am. I'm going to give the opportunity to, to the guys on Microsoft Teams for a couple of questions, if you don't mind, and then we'll come back to you. Okay, so also to summarize, there's quite a few questions. People really want to know who are the liquidators, okay. who are the liquidators. Okay, so let's start there in terms of who are the liquidators, okay. So the liquidators at this stage, I, I can't tell you because the one only was only filed today, okay? And it, so I think in terms of who the liquidators are, we will share that information on the on the platforms that we have available, okay? As soon as I'm aware. So yeah, that answers that question. Okay, so the, will the, the question is, will the liquidators co contact the, the investors? You must remember, I'll go back to the statutory manager. The statutory manager will have access to the portal and to the database and will then, am I correct, will then contact the investors and, and let them know. So I think it'll come more from the statutory manager. Is that correct, I'm, Terence? I'm expecting to have that information because all those, all those records are all company and I'm busy, busy getting, getting those records from the company. Okay, so the statute you manage for the for the guys who didn't hear on Microsoft Teams, he's busy getting those records and he will make he will send out communication. Um, then for investors who invested it recently Okay. So <laughs> It, in, it, the question is about investors who invested recently as March, and I get this question a lot. They invested after the Black Swan event. Doesn't matter what time you invested. If you invested three years ago, you invested two weeks ago, you're an investor. You, everybody's in the same boat. So it's, it's f f yeah, everybody's in the same boat. There isn't anybody being paid. There isn't anybody, things like that. That's going to go through the statute manager and the liquidation. We have investors that were paid as late as August this year. Okay, but that you'll have to share the information we'll have to obtain. I got, I got, got, got the proof as well. So that's fine, just send it to me. So this also understanding from, I can tell you from experience, I'm not a liquidator, but what I do know is that from a liquidation process is that transactions can be reversed. So yes. How is SARS involved? Has the company been paying tax? So, so we know, we, we yeah. Okay. So uh, when, when we see reason to do so, when we see merit in it, we share our information with SARS. Um, it's a little bit early for that. Um, you don't want SARS to take your money. Uh, you know, let's first see what we can give back to the investors. But we running the company as, as like, properly. They've got decent records. Yeah. So we haven't involved SARS yet, but we usually do. Okay, so the, the question is, well, have they been running the country company properly? And uh, <clears throat> to be honest, it's early days. I'm still exactly investigating that. Uh, today was the first, first day that I, that I had sight of any form of company um, records, records ma management accounts. Um, and uh, that was one of the first things I looked out for, and I did see a payment and records to, uh, to SARS. So I, I know that there's some kind of relationship there, what the nature of that relationship is, and how complete that is, how complete are these these management accounts that I've received, the veracity of, of all that information is still yet to be yet to be investigated. Okay. Uh, Paula, I'm gonna come back to you now. So I just want to take one or more two questions from the people on Microsoft Teams. Carry on. I can't hear you. Okay. Okay. So just in terms of where you're representing somebody, okay, you must remember that a statement from a third party is hearsay evidence and it cannot be submitted. Okay. If it's in terms of representation for a legal process and that person has to do so using a power of attorney, you can't represent somebody without a power of attorney. And in terms of that person's mental ability, that person must be of sound mind for that power of attorney to be effective. If that person is not of sound mind, your mother's got dementia and you're running your affairs, then it has to be done through curatorship. Um, I'll reply to the second part of that question. What's the purpose of the affidavit? Speaking for my investigation team, the purpose of the affidavit is for us to build a case um, if there was any misconduct. So let me just be clear. We don't need 
an affidavit from every investor. We just need to show a pattern. And we've got a lot of affidavits already. So if you don't get around to your affidavit getting it to us, that's not the end of the world. It doesn't influence your claim. It has nothing to do with with the liquidation. It has nothing to do with the distribution of funds. It is merely for the FCA to build a case and to assist the police. Yeah, just on that note, from the, from the SAFSA's perspective, same thing. There's 1,300 investors. I don't need 1,300 investors. If we've got 50 or 100 statements, it shows modus operandi and shows the pattern. Okay, next question. Okay, last one. Uh, the city manager appointed for both the city and the Imagina. Same question. Statutory manager for both Imagina and Presidium, not Imagina. Okay, no, the, so the statutory manager, if, uh, and I stand to be corrected, is only for Presidium because Presidium was a regulated entity. Yeah, okay, the, the two Presidiums, because, because it was a juristic, juristic, <laughs> ah, you know what I'm saying. Okay, no, oh, I haven't been drinking, I promise you. But yeah, not for Imagina. Okay, I think we've tackled that. Okay, ma'am, you had a question, let's come to you. No, we're not. Have we answered? Okay. Oh, okay. Guys, so let's start to wrap up. I want to try and get, can we can we can we get to five five questions? Would five be okay? Okay. Well, so on my side, if I do a story, uh, yes. story, the only chance we have is to enforce the enforceable undertaking and to speed that process up to see if there's any honesty in what they promised. Th that's correct. So, so, so that's the only option we have, I mean, and then we will know whether we, we will get any funds back. Okay, so the gentleman for those on Microsoft Teams is saying that in terms of the enforceable option is the option that, that, that we have available yeah, right now. Can that be speeded up so that we have an answer? So, so, so yeah, so look, I, I don't think it's your only option because obviously liquidation, but the concern is from an immediate cash flow to get your money now. The but fastest the approach enforceable is the enforceable undertaking. Okay, all right, sir, question? Yeah, you know, as far as the us going against the banks, they've sent all these millions and millions out the country. They presumably had to have some reserve bank uh, allowance. Yes, Do we but have an action against any bank that may have sent so, money out? And so I think just from, uh, from that perspective and that you must remember that there has to be an investigation. If there's any wrongdoing from, from any any entity, a be it a bank or anything like that, that's picked up, that will go through its proper channels, through the banking ombudsman. And uh, Am I right, Harold? Or, uh, just maybe you want to address that? Yeah, 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 look, well, the Reserve Bank, I suppose, or the Prudential Authority. I, I think you make a good point, sir. There's certainly the possibility of an action there, but you will have to get legal advice and it'll have to be investigated. It doesn't necessarily have to be a forensic investigation like we do, but... Um, I don't know whether there is a claim based on the fact that the banks let it out with, with, without authority, but it's certainly something you should be looking at. But your report will show, go into that? It won't go into that uh, transgression because remember, our jurisdiction ends with contraventions of a financial sector law, our own laws that we enforce. So, but our report will certainly talk to the money flow out of the country, certainly. Just also from a SAPS perspective, that, so where, where, where these are found to be certain crimes and stuff like that, that will go to the relevant authority. So SARS or the Reserve Bank, you must remember that the Prudential Authority and in terms of these different entities that investigate different spot, spots. But any time that we, be it FIXO or be it SAPS identifies that there's, a, there's another party or another government, if you want to call it department, it's the same with the, the Reserve Bank, and that's why I mentioned the Reserve Bank, and in terms of SARS, but they will get involved because they're the specialists in that particular field. Okay. Um, I've seen, just from looking up on the internet about Craig, this doesn't seem to be his first. No. He, he seems to have gotten a bit slick with this. There's some, also some stuff with fraudulent passports that I picked up as well. So, um, okay. I also have, I actually phoned another company that had him involved. Um, how do we stop him you know, managing funds? Because he's listed quite, quite often. Okay. So the first thing I just want to state before I let Carrot answer the thing is the one thing I just want to thing is put a point out. There's a lot of theories out there, okay, conspiracy theories. To be very honest with you, okay. So and it and it does it, it, it to investigate all the different stuff. I know. I do know for a fact there was a case opened in 2015. We're aware of that, and that has been part of our current investigation. So we do look back at that spot portion, okay. All right. Question. I've got three. Anybody want to take? You've got three left. Three. Three goes. 
Three, we got two, we got two, we got two, we got, there we go, there we go. Let me just, can I sorry, just sorry, add, sorry. To add to that from FEC point of view, if, if we come to the conclusion after the investigation that uh, there was misconduct, material misconduct, then we will debar that individual out of the uh, industry. They cannot legally manage funds on behalf of other people. So that all sounds very great. The problem is, how do I stop him from doing it in any event? Because investors are not going to check whether he has a license or not. Okay. Okay, we've got the last two questions. Uh, Michael? Um, Craig, yes. How do you stop him, okay, if he is from trading in his personal capacity or his wife from trading in her personal capacity? So, so the problem is, you know, the, the problem is it's like, how do you stop crime? To be honest with you. Yeah, any crime. How do I stop any crime from happening? Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's how we do. So yeah. So it's 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 not something we can we can stop. Sorry, Brad. The best way will be to take his assets away, so that he won't be able to trade anything. If he's guilty of this process of fraud and proceeds of crime, in the end, you won't have any assets to trade under the breach. Hundred percent assets and put him in jail, and that's how we do it. But up until that point, that's it. Okay. I'm going to allow because I said three. I'm going to allow this gentleman, and then I'm going to come back to you. Then we're going to call it quits. Classifying the investors, I know for a fact that a lot of Brazilian people were actually investors as well. Um, in the repatriation of these funds, do you disqualify them? So, on, on, on so what basis? Oh, yeah. on, the, on the basis that, I mean, I, I, I heard from Andrew's wife, for instance, that he was investing in the fund himself. So, but now you must remember, can I, can I try and answer that question? So you must remember that no person can be biased in terms of, of the claim. But now you must remember, let's say he traded, let's say he traded 10 million and, and he gets a million rand back, which is great. But if the asset forfeiture unit and civilly, then that million will go back in terms of the litigation and stuff like that. But to say that he can't lay a claim as a creditor, no, no, for sure. that's no, okay. Okay, last question. Are there one country and does America operate? Okay, so... Uh, the people that are, so the people are where they are. So Andrew is in the States. Craig Mussein is in South Africa. He is in Cape Town. We are where the thing, and I just, in terms of uh, the, the bringing back in terms of extradition and stuff like that, we have extradition agreements with parties. But again, I just want to point out that a person has to be, a, be con uh, there has to be a fraud case. There's no extradition for civil matters. Okay. Okay, guys, I think, I think we've, 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 we're going to come, yo, oh, man. I can see some of you stretching just like me and my wife's laughing at me because I'm getting old. Okay, guys, I, th I think I don't want to have us keeping it till midnight. I think we're going to draw it a line. We've tried to be as informative as we, we can. I certainly hope that you found it has been useful and helpful to you. Okay, we will still continue to send out information as much as we can. If you do have information, so I'd like to chat to that gentleman about the tax certificates. Okay, Wayne, you need to chat to Tanikila and them about the stuff. Okay. We'll just check because I don't know what I've sent in the docket. Some of the stuff might be really in the stuff that we, because Wayne gave me stuff earlier, but we can chat about that separately. Okay. Um, on behalf of myself and the regulator, Fixer, and everybody, and also I just want to say thank you to uh, to Brad and to his team, to Carrot, and to the guys for making their time to sit down on it. Sorry? Yeah. What? Uh, sorry, Re register. <laughs> what? Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, if anybody has any more statements they want to give me, so we have taken statements. You can give them to myself. Reg and myself will certify stuff. If there's uh, Tandinkila, I don't know if you need to see anybody or you guys or, or Jacques, you need to do statements. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, from the presentation, what's been covered, if you have any information that has not been covered in this presentation, you know about another entity, another presidium. You know about a different platform that hasn't been covered. We ask that you account. come, but different bank account, anything that hasn't been mentioned yet, and you're aware. Can I kindly ask that you speak to the people that are sitting in the front chair, to Jacques, or to Tandem Kile, or Shahida, or to Kharot. Okay. Guys, I think we're going we're gonna to close the meeting off. There is, this has been recorded, so, and at Microsoft Teams, I don't know who of the 200 are still there, haven't fallen asleep behind their computers. But um, there is a, and we, I will try and post this onto, probably onto a blog or onto a platform that you can access. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Have a safe trip, and we'll chat to you soon. Thank you very much.
Thanks for organizing. No problem. Thank you, everybody on Microsoft Teams. Have a good evening.